hi guys this is chevin academy welcome back to this channel in this video i'm going to be discussing about the effective width of a flange beam and we are going to be using the standard of bsen 1992 part one of one which is the euro code design the effective width of flange or let me just say the effective length of a member can actually be found in clause 5 of the code so generally we know that beam can be designed as either a rectangular beam or a flange beam when do we design a beam to be flanged this is when the beam is connected to a slab at the top so when a beam is connected to a slab at the top so you can that is when you form a flange beam but flange beam is also divided into two we have the t beam and the l beam the t beam is the beam that forms that is in the intermediate part of the slab so you can see the one in the middle is considered to be t beam where you have slab at the top at the left and right side of it but when but the hand part of the beam that is the end beam is considered as l beam because in this case there is no slab attached to the other side so let's say there's a slab attached to it at the top here then you now consider it as a t beam but since there is no slab so it's considered as an l beam the effective width of flange is actually applicable not just in solid slab and beams it's also important when you are discussing about waffle slab and rib slab because you know in that case there is rib that is being connected to the slab to reduce the span so in that case you have to also determine the effective width of flange when you are designing a waffle slab or a rib slab so the procedure is all the same so if you look at a precast section of a double t beam you can see that this beam is connected to slab at the top and then the two double beam is forming a t section so this is applicable both in precast and also in cast in situ section that is when the beam and the slab are cast together so in that case you need to determine the effective flange width the fairly flange width is the part of the slab that contribute to resisting of load of the beam i hope this is clear so let us now look at a typical diagrammatic representation of the effective width of flange so this is for a typical t beam this is what we are going to have you can see that the beam is connected to the slab so and not the, the total part of the slab is being is contributing to the to be the flange of the beam theoretically we used to take the distance between the face of the support divided by two as the width of flange but we have to determine the actual part of the width that contributed to the resistant load so that's what came about effective flange width so the effective flange width is given as b e f f so why for t beam you have b f f1 and b f f2 bff1 and bff2 is the part of the slab that is attached to the beam on the left hand side and right hand side respectively then you also have bw bw is the width of the rib that is the web part of the of the beam you know when you are talking about flange beam you have the rib and you also have the web so the width of the web is considered bw so from this from this representation you can see that the effective flange width of beam is equals to bw plus bff1 plus bff2 i hope that is clear so now let us now look at how do we now determine bff1 and bff2 so considering a t beam and an l beam so the second diagram here is showing l beam and t beam so for a t beam b effective is equals to bw plus bff1 and 2 but for l beam is equals to bw plus bff1 this is because for l beam you only have slab attached to one side it is not attached to the other side so that's why it's just plus bff1 so bff1 is just equals to 0.2 b1 plus 0.1 l naught which must be less than 0.2 l naught which must also be less than b1 
So we are going to take a, an example so that you can understand this. The same thing for BFF2. In the formula of BFF1, you just substitute B2. So B1 and B2 is the distance of the adjacent spans. I hope this is clear. And L0 is given as the distance between points of zero moment. So the distance between point of zero moment is also described in the code. So we have for an isolated member in which we only have a single span. For example, the first diagram here is explaining where you have where you have a pin pin support at the at the end of the span. So in that case, the effective L naught is equal to is equal to the length of the of the span. As you can see in the first diagram, figure 5.7a of the code. Then when the hand is is cantilevered, that is, we have a cantilever hand and a free hand in the other side. Then in that case, the effective length is given as twice the length. So this goes on and on. The second, the third one is when you have a fixed end and a pin support. Example is a prop cantilever. So in that case, the effective length is 0.7L. So this goes on and on. But let's now consider the case of a continuous member. For example, in a continuous slab and also in a rib or waffle slab. So those kind of members are tend to be a continuous member. So in that case, this is what the code specify, you know. L0 is the distance between point of zero moment. So for if for the end part of the of the beam, so you take the L0 to be 0 0.87 L1 because this is considered to be the L the L beam but in case of the interior part which is this interior part of the beam so this is considered to be 0 0.7 L1 plus L2 then for the for the middle part the one had the middle you consider one to be 0 0.7 0 0.7 L2 the L2 is the distance between the two support that is this support and this support L1 is distance between this support and this support having understand this if we cannot determine L0 B1 B2 all you just have to do is just to slot that in into the formulas that I've given earlier and then you'll be able to determine the effective width of your flange so let us let us now take a couple of examples so that we can understand what this is actually talking about but before we do that if you like what i've been explaining to you kindly the subscribe button like this video give me a thumbs up and turn on the notification but let us look at this layout this is a typical reinforced concrete layout of a building so we want to consider beam fb01 so to check for the effective width of this beam so the first thing you have to determine is what type of beam is beam fbo1 if you look at the beam the beam has four span we have a span between the line one to three three to five five to seven and seven to eight let us look at the effective width of the second span that is the beam between grid line three to five so the first thing you have to determine is what type of beam is it so this beam is said to be 225 by 450 in, in depth, in size. And then you can see that it's attached to two slab. We have a slab panel 2 on the, on the bottom side. Then you also have a slab panel 5 on the top side. So since you have slab attached to, to the left and right, then that kind of beam is a T-beam. Hope you understand. So if you look at beam, beam 4 between grid line 7 and 8 this beam let me try to highlight it this beam here you see that this beam is only connected to one slab at the top which is panel 4 there is no slab connected to it in this other side so this type of beam is an l beam i hope you understand so to estimate this now all we have to do is to determine the parameters of the beam you need to make use of this diagram that i've showed earlier this this second beam is considered to be an interior panel this is an interior interior span 
so definitely what we are going to use for the effective light is going to be 0. Uh, 0. 0.7 l2 that is 0. 0.7 multiplied by this span you know if you correlate this beam o1 to what we have in the diagram below you can see that grid line one is the same thing as this first one grid line three is the same thing as this grid line five is the same thing as this so definitely l1 is going to be the dimension between the slab so we want to look at we want to determine the bff for f beam o1 the beam between grid line three and five so the first thing is the bw the bw is the width of the beam from the dimension here you can see that the beam is 225 by 450 definitely the width is 225 then the next thing is to determine the the l of the beam so looking at this diagram l1 is equal to 4840 i just try to zoom in into the dimensions if you cut a section along the beam this is what you're going to have l1 is 4 840 which is what we have here l2 is 4800 millimeters so definitely for beam for beam between grid line 3 and 5 l0 is going to be 0 0.5 l2 which is what we have here so let's say the beam is the end part of the beam if it is the end part of the beam let's say we are set to determine the bff for the beam between grid line 1 and 3 you no know, 1 and 3 is the end span so in that case, L0 is going to be 0.85 L1. I hope you understand. Well, because the one we want to determine is an interior span. So that's why L0 is 0.7 L2. Once we've been able to determine L0, we now have to move forward and determine B1 and B2. To determine B1 and B2, this is what you have to do. You have to cut a section along the beam. So you know this is the beam we want to determine the effective width. So you have to cut the section along the beam like this so if you cut a section like that you are going to have this so this is the beam we intend to determine the effective width this beam here you can see that the beam is a t beam looking at the section you have a cantilever which is panel 5 at the left hand side and you also have a panel 2 at the right hand side the length of this panel 2 this length here is 565 as you can see and then the length of the cantilever is 11 one one three so having understand that you can now determine your b1 and b2 so from here now b1 is going to be equals to this span that is from the middle of from the center of the beam minus the remaining part of the beam you know the beam is 225 half of 225 is the same thing as i want 2.5 which is the same thing as approximately 113 so if you do that divided by 2 you have 500 millimeters for b1 for b2 is going to be this span 5560 minus the thickness of the beam divided by 2 you have 667.5 millimeters so that is how to determine b1 and b2 so the trick here is that to determine the l for l you have to look at the beam as a whole if it is a continuous beam then if you now want to determine b1 and b2 you cut a section along the beam so this is the beam we want to determine beam o1 3 slash 5. so moving forward from here now we can now determine since we know l not b1 and b2 we can get ff1 by just substituting it inside this equation so that will be 0.3 b1 which is 500 plus 0 0.1 l naught l naught is 3360 so you have this value and this must be less than 0 0.2 l naught 0 0.2 l naught is 672 which was actually less than it and it must always be less than b1 which is 500 so you are going to pick the lowest value from this equation so the lowest is 436 then for ff2 because the beam we want to estimate is a t beam so we have one and two so 0 0.2 b2 plus 0 0.1 l naught 0 0.2 b2 is 869.5 the other one is 672 and then b2 is 267.5 so the lowest is here is 672 so 672 is the lowest it satisfies all this condition so definitely our bff is cost to bw plus bff1 plus bff2 so at the end of the day you have 
225 plus 436 plus uh, 672. So addition of this three is going to give us 133 millimeters. So this is how the section of the beam is going to look like. You have a beam. This is the beam. You see BW, you see BFF1, BFF2, and this is the BFF. So at the end of the day, BFF1 was 636, 436. BW is 225, the width of the beam. BFF2 is 672. So at the end of the day, the flange width depth, the flange width is going to be 133 three millimeters so this is how you are going to estimate the effective width of your flange either you are considering a continuous slab a rib slab or a waffle slab i hope you've learned one or two things in this video don't forget to subscribe and like this video you can share it with your friends thank you see you next time